All right, let me ask you to take your Bible and look with me in the book of Acts, chapter 16. We're going to close out this ser series of messages that I've been preaching about the God of the valleys. And I want to talk uh, this today about when you're in the valley of bitterness, give thanks. God's there. God is there. We're going to read a very familiar story, and if you would honor God's Word by standing with me, beginning in verse 22 of chapter 16 in the book of Acts, Dr. Luke is writing the book of Acts. He's reporting the Apostle Paul's missionary work, and he says in verse 22, the crowd there in Philippi, the crowd in Philippi rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them, and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. Now, I want to explain what that means. Uh, that, that may sound like, well, they take like fishing poles or something and whack them across the back, but that's not what they would do. They would take something like a bamboo um, pole, and they would split it down the middle, and then they would split it crosswise so that it's in four sections. And when they beat their, their victims, those four pieces would spread out and the sharp edges of that bamboo reed would slash their backs open. So it would just lacerate their backs. And when they had struck, struck them with many blows, Luke said, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Probably didn't have much choice. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not hurt yourself. We're all here. And he called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with all his household. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, as we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, it's characterized in many homes across the United States with stuffed turkeys and stuffed bellies and stuffed recliners. But there's something far more important about Thanksgiving than just turkey and dressing and ham. Thanksgiving was actually started back in 1623 on November 19th by Governor William Bradford, the governor of Plymouth Colony. It was originally intended by the pilgrims that they were going to declare a day of mourning and fasting for all the hardships and all the problems they had and all the many people that died in their journey and in trying to settle in a new land. But Governor Bradford said, no, we're not going to have mourning and fasting. We're going to have a day of thanksgiving and feasting. Some 200 years later, President Abraham Lincoln declared it a national holiday in 1863 and has remained such until now. You know, it's not hard to give thanks to God when good things happen. When, when the waters are smooth, when the wind's at your back, when everything's going well, it's not hard at all to thank God. But it's a different thing when it comes to the blues and the blows of life. Life is hard. 
Life can be real hard sometimes. And I look out across this congregation, and some of you that are watching online, and probably you look back, back across 20, 2022, and you think, you know, I lost my mother, I lost my, my wife, I lost my dad, I lost my husband, I lost my child. I lost my job. I lost my health. What do I have to be thankful for? This has been a horrible year. Well, the Apostle Paul says in other places, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, for example, he says, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, even our Father. Again, to the church in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says there, In verses 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, God, that's pretty tough. Going through what I've gone through, that's that's a pretty big request to make, for me to give thanks in the situations that I'm in. Let me give you a little context of this story so you understand if you're not real familiar with the story. The Apostle Paul and his partner Silas and Dr. Luke, the physician, had gone into the city of Philippi. When they did that, something historical happened in the church. The gospel moved from one continent to another. Philippi is in Europe. And suddenly the gospel switches into a whole other gear. And the apostle Paul and Silas come in. They begin to preach in Philippi. And he says many people were coming to Christ. And there happened to be a young lady who was a slave girl. And Luke says she was demonically possessed. And this demonic entity that possessed her gave her the ability to tell fortunes, to be able to tell people's future, tell them what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next week. And while Paul and Silas were preaching, this slave girl began to follow them around because of this demonic presence in her and, and, and hassle them. And just stayed right on them and creating all kind of havoc. And finally, Paul had enough of it. And he turned to her and he addressed the demon in her and said, depart from her immediately. And suddenly, the demon left this young girl. Well, when the demon left the girl, she lost the ability to tell fortunes. And it caused her masters to be highly irate because they were making a lot of money off of her, fortune telling. And so they grabbed Paul and Silas, and the Bible says they drug them into the inner part, the center of the city, and they began to yell out to all the crowds, these men are creating unrest in our city, and they are Jews. And all the people just fell on them. They began beating them. And that's where we picked up on our story here. They took rods and they stripped their clothes off. They beat, beat their backs. And then they commanded that they be thrown in jail for public unrest, for creating a riot in the city of Philippi. Later, some years later, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church that was planted in this city when they were making this visit. He was in a Roman prison when he wrote that letter. And he writes to the church in Philippi and says, I thank God for my circumstances because it has served to further the gospel. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Thank God for being in a prison. But Paul said it served to further the gospel here in Rome. So I want to say to you this morning, when we're in the valley of circumstances that can lead to bitterness, 
give thanks. Because a thankful heart, a heart of praise, a heart of gratitude is the perfect medicine to deal with a heart of bitterness. Matthew Henry was a great theologian and scholar of the 19th and 20th century. And one day Matthew Henry got robbed by some thieves. And he wrote in his journal these words. He said, first, I'm thankful that I've never been robbed before. Second, I'm thankful that though they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, I'm thankful that although they took all, it wasn't much. (laughs) And finally, he said, number four, I am thankful that it was I who was robbed and not I who did the robbing. You ever feel like, boy, I tried to serve God, tried to follow God, and look where it's gotten me. Nothing but trouble. The Apostle Paul could say that more than any of us here. In fact, he did say it. He said that as I have served God, as I've preached the gospel, I've been shipwrecked, I've been bitten, I've been snake bitten, I've been left out in the cold, I've starved, almost drowned, stoned almost and left for dead. Over and over and over, Paul talks about the things that he endured preaching the gospel. And and we, we may get that tendency to develop a spirit of bitterness and say, this ain't right. This ain't fair. Trying to serve God and bad things are happening to me. It's sort of like the attitude of a British poet and cynic named Charles Swinburne. He wrote in the 19th century, Thou hast conquered O pale Galilean, the world grows gray from thy breath. Charles Swinburne had that idea that you follow God and he's going to mess you up. You're going to have problem after problem after problem. Maybe some of you here today feel like, you know, God established Murphy's Law for your life. You know, if something can go wrong, It will. Nothing looks as easy as it seems. Everything takes longer than I think. Every line in the grocery store to check out moves faster than the one that I'm in. You ever been there? Yeah. You're making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You get the peanut butter and jelly on a piece of bread and you're fixing to slap the other piece on there. And before you do, your hand trembles and the bread falls and the juicy part always falls on the floor. Right? You think, finally, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and then you discover it's a freight train coming straight at you. Life gets hard. And it's easy to stray into the valley of bitterness. But I want to tell you, the Apostle Paul and Silas believed God had them right where he wanted them. Right where they needed to be. In a jail cell in Philippi, beaten with rods. They knew they were where God wants them to be. Now let me, let me say something to you. If you can't be thankful... To God for where you are. You won't be thankful to God anywhere else you are. If you can't be thankful to God for where you are, you won't be thankful any other place you are. A grateful heart gives praise in the midst of trouble. A second lesson we learn in this is that a grateful heart enhances our witness to those in spiritual darkness. If you look in verse 25, Luke says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns 
of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I want you to get this picture. It's pitch dark. There's no lights. There's no night lights. And there are no cots to lay on. Some of you are going to be going with me to Philippi in April. You'll see the city of Philippi. They've all, they've, in fact, they uncovered a jail. Now, we're not positive that's the one the Apostle Paul stayed in, although it's inscribed on the wall, Paul is here. But it was a jail, nonetheless. But they're in this jail. There's no comforts. It's dark. It's cold. It stinks. It's full of prisoners. And here is Paul and Silas singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. That saved a wretch like me. Those prisoners were in the Alcatraz of Philippi. They were in a hard place. And it was dark. They were looking for a little hope, a little light. And people in spiritual darkness are no different from them. They're looking for a little light. And when you and I can have a grateful heart, even in the midst of tough times, even in the midst of of pain, even in the midst of suffering, they cannot help but see and hear that light that comes out of our, our lives. The third thing, the last thing that we see in this story is that a grateful heart engenders forgiveness in the place of bitterness. In verse 27, after the earthquake occurred, and I want to tell you, this is no, no plain earthquake. You know, it shook the ground. Rocks are falling. Might even collapse the cell or two. But the thing that gets me is that it unshackled all of the prisoners. Now, that's some kind of earthquake. And the Roman guard rushes in, and he knows the rule. The rule is if you're in charge and you're in custody of a prisoner and that prisoner escapes, you pay for his life with your life. So he rushes in, he draws his sword, assuming all the prisoners are gone since the doors are open, and he starts to run that sword through his heart, and Paul yells out, all here, don't hurt yourself. Now, i got to be honest. If I'd have been there, I might have said, Hey, buddy, you're toast. You better just go ahead and run that sword through you right now because the Romans are coming. But Paul didn't do that. Paul said, Don't hurt yourself. And it gave him an opportunity to share the gospel with this Philippian jailer. It's interesting, if you read, as you read the text... In verse 30, the, the, the Roman guard brought them out, and he asked them the question. He said, sirs, what do I have to do to be saved? Now, that's, that's a theological term. This guy is a Roman pagan, and he's saying, what do I have to do to be saved? How did he know to even ask that question? Because he had heard the gospel around town. He had heard the story about these two preachers that were preaching about a man who died on a cross, was buried in a grave, and rose again on the third day, and he offers salvation, eternal life to all who would believe in him. And so this this jailer says, "What, what, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? And Paul and Silas didn't say, man, I'd love to tell you, but after what you did to us, forget it. You find out on your own. No, they didn't do that. They immediately said, with you believe with all of your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. You commit your life to Him. You'll be saved. And your household will follow you. And they did. It teaches us that a thankful heart holds no grudges doesn't keep a long list. I've known people before that 
They harbored resentment for years and years in their heart towards somebody that may have done something wrong to them. They felt like they did anyway. And they can't let it go. And they keep that bitterness inside of them. Somebody said a long time ago, bitterness and revenge is the poison that we drink thinking it's going to kill somebody else. It only hurts you. It only hurts me when we have those kind of grudges. Listen, grudges and blame never affirms anyone. It always assaults somebody else. It never forgives. It only condemns. It never forgets. It always remembers over and over and over and over again. It never restores. It only wounds. And usually it wounds you deeper than anyone else. And it never unites. It always divides and separates and destroys. A thankful heart seeks to redeem, not retaliate. So I want to say to you this morning at the conclusion of this series, when you get in a valley of circumstances that are causing you bitterness, give thanks. Give thanks. It will heal that bitterness. It was 59 years ago, almost to the day, that a student at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth had finished a long day of finals, and he decided to take a drive just to relax and clear his mind. Believe me, if you've had a whole day of finals in seminary, you're ready for some peace and rest. And he got in his car and he drove to North Fort Worth and he pulls up to a cemetery and stops. And what's a quiet place, right? He gets out of his car and he walks in the cemetery and he goes and he, he finds a bench and he sits down on the bench and he's just sitting there letting all the anxiety and all the stress from all, all those tests and things just kind of flow out of him and and behind the bench is a shrub, and on the other side of the shrub, he hears a woman sobbing. And he gets up, and he walks around the shrub, and he asks the lady, he said, can I help you? And she looked at him, and she said, prayer vigils are being held for a slain policeman, and a nation is mourning for a young president that has fallen. But she said, no one will pray for a mother whose son will always be remembered as an assassin. Bitterness can kill us. And the greatest thanks is this. You may not be an assassin, but all of us here are sinners. All of us have violated God's character and God's will. And God has made a promise. A promise we give thanks for this week. That He supplies grace that covers all of our sin when we seek Him.